بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد الحمد لله we are on page fifty nine of Adab al-Mufrad and we were just finishing hadith number 16 and I explained that the English translation is only of the first hadith but actually in the Arabi there is one more issue that we did not talk about yet so reading this hadith again عن مغيرة رضي الله تعالى عن قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله حرم عليكم عقوق الأمهات Again, this is not in the English, this is only in the Arabic ووعد البنات ومنا وحات وكره لكم قير وقال وكثرة السؤال وإضاءة المال Now, الحمد لله رب العالمين We finished almost every aspect of this hadith But we left one thing out in this hadith, it says that Rasulullah sallallahu has said, Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it forbidden to disobey our mothers. The second thing, wa'dal banat, the bearing of daughters. And the rest of the hadith we discussed. The only thing left to discuss was the practice of jahiliya Arab, the, jahil, the time of ignorance that was a custom amongst the Arabs which was Wa'dul Banat where they would bury their daughters alive and we know that the Quran speaks about this in many ayat وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ that when the, the, the one buried will, will ask on Yom Al Qiyamah, bi ayyidan bin qutilat. For what sin was she killed? Now we all know that this was a custom at the time of Jahiliyyah, but what we don't know, a lot of us, is how it actually became a custom. Such a horrible practice. What happened is there were there was one person by the name of Qais bin Amir bin Asim, Qais bin Asim, Qais bin Asim. He had a daughter. And it just so happened that the tribe that Qais bin Asim was from, they got in a war with the neighboring tribe. So what happened was they lost the war and his daughter was taken into slavery or as a hostage, whatever situation it may be. And she was actually married to the leader of that tribe. So, after a few years, there's time for treaty between the two clans. So, when it came time for the treaty, one of the conditions of the treaty that Qais bin Asim put in was that my daughter would be returned to me. And they said, okay, fine, this is understandable. So, when they go sign the treaty and now the situation is presented to his daughter well she's been married for it quite some time now and she doesn't want to go back home she says no I'm staying here with my husband from this incident Qais bin Asim had so much embarrassment ghayra anger that he swore to Allah that from this day on any baby girl that I have I will bury her alive. Naudhu billah min dhalika. And he was one of the first to start this custom of jahiliya. The Quran says that there was another reason why people would do this wa'dul banat. Which was khashyat al-imlak. Fear of hunger or poverty. That if we have a child that we won't be able to provide for this child and we will go hungry. But we have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Razik, the provider. 
It is not as in our responsibility to provide. Now, at the same time of Qais bin Amr, there was another person by the name of Sa'sa bin Najiya. And now, he was the total opposite. When he saw the people doing this horrible thing, he started buying all of the daughters that were being sold and uh, being killed. And he would say, instead of, instead of burying them, killing them, I'll pay you money and you can have money instead. And then he would raise them up and marry them off and take care of them. Alhamdulillah, both of these people had very long lives and both of them later became Muslim. And both of them are Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Both of them became Sahabi. So this was the, the custom at the time. But the teachings obviously of Rasulullah sallallahu went totally against this horrible custom. Rasulullah sallallahu tells us in the hadith that whoever raises two daughters and is good to them, raises them until they grow up, Rasulullah sallallahu says, He will be with me in Jannah kahatain. Like these two fingers are, me and him will be in Jannah together. The question is why two? Is not one enough? Why two? It shows that he's attempting to have male children, but he's failing. Close, but I read something different. This may be correct, but I read something different. Um, um, since he's doing a good deed, um, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to say that they're going to be together. Yeah, but why two and not one? Because um, the, there are two daughters and two parents. Yes. They were in Makkah, not in the USA. <laughs> <laughs> the reason is Rasulullah sallallahu is encouraging to have more and more daughters to have more and more someone may think okay I had one alhamdulillah but no have more have more have more he's trying to go totally against this barbaric custom of that time it was a horrible custom horrible and once I'd like to narrate one incident to everyone here وَيُذْكَرُ أَنَّ سَحَابِيًّا إِسْمُهُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ مُغَفَّلْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ أَنْهُ وَعْرُضَاهُ It is narrated that there was one Sahabi and his name was Abdullah bin Mughaffal. كَانَ إِذَا جَلَسَ إِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ظَهَرَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ حُزْنًا عَظِيمٌ Whenever he would sit around the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم they would see his face with a lot of grief, sadness, extreme sadness. وَكَآبَةً فَسَأَلَهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنْ سَبَبِ حُزْنِهِ ذَلِكَ الَّذِي لَا يَنْقَتِعُ أَبَدًا So Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم asked him one day that what is the reason why you look so sad, such a sadness that never leaves you, what is wrong? فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He says, Oh Messenger of Allah, كُنْتُ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ I was in the days of ignorance. فَخَرَجْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِي زَوْجِي وَهِيَ حَامِلًا I left my wife to go somewhere while she was pregnant. وَذَهَبْتُ فِي سَفْرٍ طَوِيلٍ لَمْ أَعُدْ إِلَّا بَعْدَ السَّنَوَاتِ He said that I went for a journey a long journey, and I wasn't to return for many years. He says, I came back and she had given birth to a beautiful baby girl. She was running and playing with all the other children. The most beautiful girl you can ever imagine playing with the other girls. One day I took her and I said to her mother, 
that make her look very beautiful. Get her dressed up today. وَهِيَ تَعْلَمُ أَنِّي سَاعَدُّهَا وَأَقْتُلَهَا And her mother knew what my intention was. Her mother knew that I was going to bury her and I was going to kill her. قَالْ فَأَخَذْتُهَا So I took her فَقَامَتْ أُمُّهَا Her mother stood up. تَزَيَّنَهَا وَبِهَا مِنَ الْحَمِّ مَا بِهَا And she started getting her ready, putting nice clothes on her, putting her makeup on. And the whole while she's crying and crying and crying. And the daughter is asking, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Abu is just going to take me to a festival. وَتَقُولُ لِأَبِيهَا And after she had got her all prepared, she said to the father, لَا تُذَيِّوا الْأَمَانَ لَا تُذَيِّوا الْأَمَانَ That don't waste the trust. Don't waste this trust. يَا رَجُلْ لَا تُذَيِّوا الْأَمَانَ O man, do not waste the trust of Allah. قال So then Abdullah ibn Mughafal continues the story and he says, ثُمَّ أَخَذْتُهَا I took her. كَأَجْمَلَ كَأَجْمَلِ مَا يَكُونُ الْأَتَفَالِ بَرَاءَةً بَرَاءَةً وَجِمَالًا He says, I took her with me. The most beautiful young girl you could imagine. Innocent. بَرَاءَةً Purely innocent. فَخَرَجْتُ بِهَا إِلَى شِعَبٍ مِنْ شِعَابٍ So I took her with me to one of the valleys around the city. وَبَقَيْتُ فِي ذَلِكَ الشِّعْبِ أَبْحَثُ أَنْ بِعْرٍ أَعْرِفُ أَعْرِفُ هُنَاكَ He says that I went walking around in this valley with her looking for a well that I knew was in this valley. فَجِدْتُ إِلَى بِعْرٍ تَوِيلٍ دَوِيَّةٍ I found a well very deep and dark and empty. لَيْسَ فِيهَا قَطْرَةُ مَاءٍ there wasn't one drop of water in this well. قال فوقفت على شفيري بئر and he says that I stood at the edge of this well. I stood there. أنظر إلى تلك الصغيرة and I'm looking at my little daughter. And I'm looking at her. فرق قلبي لما بها من البراءة He says my heart it started to tremble because she was so beautiful and so innocent. She had not done anything. وَلَيْسَ لَهَا ذَنْبٍ And she had no sin. She did nothing wrong. ثُمَّ أَتَذَكَّرُ نِكَاهُهَا وَفَسَاحَتَهَا فَسَاحَهَا He's like, I was remembering that one day she will get married and all the things that will happen while she's getting married. فَيَقْسُ قَلْبِي عَلَيْهَا Then my heart would get hard again. وَبَيْنَهَا تَيْنِ الْعَاطِفَتَيْنِ أَعِيشِ he says, this was my situation. I'm going from my soft heart to my hard heart. In between. Aishu, I don't know what to do. قَالَ ثُمَّ مَجْمَعْتُ قُوَّائِي I got all my strength together. فَأَخَذْتُهَا فَنَكَبْتُهَا عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهَا فِي وَسْتِ تِلْكَ الْبَيْرِ He says that I gained all of my strength that I had and I took her and I threw her into the well. And she fell down all the way to the well. And he says that I'm staring at her and I'm wondering and I'm waiting. Has she passed away? Has she died? وَإِذَا بِهَا تَقُولُ And she's there saying, يَا أَبْتَى يَا أَبْتَى O Father, my dear Father, ذَيَّعْتِ amana. You wasted the trust. You broke the trust. Ya abata, ya abata, the ya tal amana. You broke the trust. Turadiduha, turadiduha, hatta in kata, so to her. She kept saying it over and over again. The ya tal amana. The ya tal amana. Turadiduha, turadiduha, repeating it until her voice stopped. For wallahi ya rasulullah. He says, I swear, ya Allah, by Allah. Ya Rasulullah, I swear by Allah, ma dhakartu tilka al-hadithah 
illa wa alanil husni wal ham that any time i remember that incident i'm filled with such grief and such horrible feelings walaw kana dhalika fil islam even if now i'm already muslim i still feel these feelings although that happened in the past thumma nadara ilayhi ila nabi thumma nadara ilayhi nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa idha dumu'uhu tahraqu ala lihyatihi when he looked up at the rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's eyes were filled with water and he's crying and crying and crying until the water is on his beard and he says to him ya abdullah wallahi if i was to establish the had on anyone for an act they did in jahiliyyah i would have done it to you because of this horrible deed you did but now islam has erased everything you did islam has wiped out everything you did this was the practice that they were doing in those days wa'd al-banat killing innocent baby girls and rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his teachings came to wipe this out to end this horrible practice One of the primary reasons we see for there's a concept subhanallah there's a concept called ghira ghira and ghira is a word very hard to translate into English some people say you can't translate it into English cuz they don't have ghira there is no such thing as ghira but what we learn now is that there's a balance there's an extreme to every attribute and what islam came to teach us is that we need to have a balance between extreme ghira see they had such ghira that they could not imagine another man marrying their daughters and whatever may happen their ghira was that strong that they did not even could imagine marriage but now our ghira has left so much that we know our situation today the ghira is the total opposite that we don't mind anyone doing anything so one of the primary reasons there are two primary reasons the ones i told you that qais bin amr he was the first to start this tradition and khashyat al imlak was another reason and the third reason was this ghira this ghira yes brother so moving on inshallah to the next hadith inshallah on page 62 <coughs> chapter 8 babu la'ana allah man la'ana walidayhi chapter 8 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses the one who curses his parents <coughs> hadith 17 حدثنا عمر بن مرزوق قال اخبرنا شعبة عن القاسم عن ابي بزة انا بتفيل قال سئل علي رضي الله تعالى عنه هل خسكم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بشيء لم لم يخص به الناس كافة we'll stop here for a little explanation this hadith says abu tufail who was a sahabi of rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم Abu Tufail <coughs> he asked Ali radhiyallahu ta'ala an a question and he asked as you see here in the english hal khassakum an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi shay has the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told you anything exclusive that he did not disclose to anyone else so here Abu Tufail who is a sahabi he's asking Ali radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu after the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam has left the world is there anything special that the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam told you that he did not tell to anyone else 
in another narration in Muslim, it says that when Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu heard this question, he got very, very, very upset. And actually, at this time, there were a lot of people asking Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu this question. What was the question? Hal khassakum an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi shayin? That did he tell you anything special that he did not tell anyone else? Now, what is the reason for this question? That is what we need to understand very quickly. Not going into all the details, but we'll get an understanding for the situation. That there was a Yemeni Jewish man. Yemeni Jewish man. His name was Abdullah bin Saba. Abdullah bin Saba. And he supposedly became Muslim. And after becoming Muslim, he traveled to Hijaz and amongst the Muslimin, he started to spread certain i'tiqad, certain beliefs and things that were new, never heard of before. Amongst those things that he was spreading was that the Prophet wasallam had told Ali radiallahu ta'ala an that he was to be the Khalifa after Rasul Sallallahu This was one of the things he said. There were a lot of other things he was saying. But when, when he went to Hijaz, Makkah, Medina, and started spreading this, he was kicked out. There were a lot of Sahaba at that time in that area. He was kicked out of here for, for saying these things. And he traveled next to Sham, kicked out of there, Basra, Kufa, kicked out of all of these places. No one was listening to him with these new things he was making up. Finally, he settled down in Misr. And unfortunately, unfortunately, he got somewhat of a following there. Now remember the saying. He's saying that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told Ali radiallahu ta'ala an that he would be the next Khalifa. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and the next thing he started to do was he started to write khutut, letters. And on those letters he would put the seal of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an. Uthman was who at the time? He was the Khalifa of the time. So Abdullah bin Saba, he would write different letters to different leaders of the, the cities in the uh, Darul Islam. And on, in these letters, he would say things like, such and such person is to be killed. Such and such person is to be killed. And he would put the stamp of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu on the stamp. And likewise, he would also send letters in the name of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that Uthman is doing very wrong. Uthman is doing very wrong. So now, Ali radiallahu ta'ala who is alive, we know that. He is the next Khalifa after Uthman. So, he would tell people that Ali radiallahu ta'ala who knows this. He knows this. So because he was spreading these rumors, a lot of people would come up to Ali radiallahu ta'ala and ask him, Did Rasul sallallahu tell you guys anything, something special that he didn't tell anyone else? And Ali radiallahu ta'ala who would get very upset. Very upset. And that is why he's being asked this question. Again, in the riwayat, in Sahih Muslim, in other books, there's more explanation on this. The same situation. But this is a rough explanation of why Abu Tufail heard this question being asked to Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. There was a lot of other things that Abdullah bin Saba started. But the primary thing, the main thing that he started was this Belief that Ali radiallahu ta'ala had special information and knowledge that he was to be the next Khalifa after Rasulullah sallallahu So now, as we continue with this hadith, قال, back to the hadith, قال, ما خسنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that Rasulullah sallallahu did not tell us anything specific. Again, in the riwayah in Muslim, it says that he got very upset. Very upset at these people asking these questions. <clears throat> and interesting enough, when he became Khalifa, 
These were the same people that had Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu killed. So when Ali finally got control, he himself had these same people killed. The same people because of Qisas, what they were doing. Yeah. And Uthman. Uthman. Ibn Uthman. So, so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu states, مَا خَسَّنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَخُصُّ بِهِ النَّاسِ إِلَّا مَا كَانْ إِلَّا مَا فِي قِرَابِ سَيْفِ He said, the Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم did not tell us anything special except what I have in the thing that I keep my... Uh, so, uh, my arrows in, uh, my sword in. That there's nothing special. All I have is this piece of paper that I keep with me all the time. So this is what they thought. They thought that on this piece of paper was some special wasiyah from Rasulullah sallallahu that he is supposed to be Khalifa. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu would take out this piece of paper and would read this piece of paper to them. And that's what we're going to read today, that what was on this piece of paper. Listen closely. Then Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he took out a piece of paper. May the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on the one who slaughters anything other than in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we slaughter any animal in the name of anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be a pious person, anything, this is close to shirk and kufr. A very, very obviously shirk and kufr. But there's a difference between slaughtering on the name of someone else and slaughtering on behalf of someone else. If we slaughter something on behalf of someone else, this is behalf, on behalf of my father who passed away, or something like this. There's one rule we have to keep in mind, that anything that is slaughtered on behalf of someone else, this becomes sadaqah. This becomes sadaqah, charity, on behalf of this person. And what is the ruling of sadaqah? Only for the miskeen, for the poor. Those who have wealth cannot eat from the sadaqah. So we have to make sure that if we do slaughter something on behalf of someone else, first of all, to slaughter in the name of someone else is shirk, kufr. We can never slaughter in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we slaughter something on behalf of someone who has passed away and we want him to get the reward, this is sadaqah. But we have to remember sadaqah cannot be eaten by those who are not poor. The hukum of sadaqah is it's for only a certain class of people. لَعَنَ اللَّهَ مَنْ سَرَقَ مَنَارَ الْأَرْضِ That Rasulullah Sallallahu said, لَعَنَ Allah, May the curse of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala be on the one that steals. <clears throat> one way of translating this would be stealing the street signs. Those things which tell people the directions. In another riwayah it says, مَنْ غَيَّرَ مَنَارَ الْأَرْضِ Whoever changes these uh, things that guide people while they're traveling. So, subhanAllah, we see that the teachings of Rasulullah Wasallam, how, how wide they are. They're not restricted to one field. That even for a person to go and change a street sign, it says one way, you turn it the other way. Rasulullah Wasallam is saying, لَعَنَ Allah. Allah. To change the speed limit. Because these signs are for the guidance of people. If you change these signs, you're misguiding people. But look at the teachings of Rasulullah They're not just restricted to in our houses. They're, it's, can, it's dealing with the whole system of government. That this becomes basically a felony or a misdemeanor. The one who changes the signs. So, if someone should, subhanAllah, it would be interesting for someone to go through the ahadith and to find all the hadith that talk about the hukuk of the streets. How many hukuk of the streets are there? 
Imatatul Adha an tariq One hadith says to take away any difficulty from the road. Question, what is Adha? What is this talking about? To take away something from the street that causes difficulty. What does this apply to? Something in the middle of the road? Something that can hurt someone? Nails. Someone is sick. Amazingly, our ustads tell us that actually this is even bigger. This is an order for those who are the civil engineers that if the road has too much traffic on it, widen the street. If there are too many potholes, you have to fix them. Rasulullah's teachings are vast. It's not just that we pick up a branch out of the street. Yes, that is it. Imatatul Adha an tariq is very vast. So it's very important to look at the, the vastness uh, of the teachings of Rasulullah. Another meaning, this is very interesting here. Another meaning of Manarul Ard is the boundaries of land. Manarul Ard, the boundaries of land. So whoever changes the boundaries, your land lives here, but you move your fence another foot. You know, he won't notice. You take another five feet if you have, a, you know, you're dealing with acres. So we take another 20 feet, he won't even notice. No, Rasulullah in this hadith is telling us that to move the borders of land, you gain the la'na of Allah, the curse of Allah. Not only that, this is an order for nations too. After World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was brought down, the British and other European countries began to start changing the Manarul Ard. Cutting up nations. Cutting up nations. They split up nations in such a way, in many places the minority became those in charge. And many times they would take people like the Kurds, and instead of giving them a place themselves, they would split them in half into two countries. This was done immediately after World War I. Leaving room for something to happen after World War II, which we're seeing the results of till today. This is la'an Allah man ghayyara manar al-ard. To change the boundaries of land. To change the boundaries of land. So, we learned that this hadith, this part of ghayyara manar al-ard, has two meanings. One deals with the uh, street signs and things of guidance. To steal these or change these, you gain the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other is dealing with boundaries. That wherever the end of your land is, to change that or alter that, you gain the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You gain the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing, la'na Allah man la'na walidayhi. That may the curse of Allah be on the one who curses his two parents. When the Sahaba heard this hadith, they were perplexed. They said, how can someone curse their own parents? They could not understand it. So Rasulullah told them, when you curse someone else's parents, and then they curse your parents, you were the cause of your parents being cursed. So now you cursed your own parents. By you cursing someone else's parents, and they in return cursing your parents, you just became the cause of the curse of your own parents. Rasulullah said, this is how a man curses at his parents. Because Sahaba could not understand something that we see every day. The Sahaba could not understand a person cursing to his own parents. But unfortunately, this is something that amongst non-Muslims, has been going on for a long time. Ever since Bart Simpson and the Simpsons has been going, it's shown a relationship between father and son. So the children are watching Bart and his dad. What does Bart call his father? Oh good, alhamdulillah. Akhbirna, <laughs> akhbirna. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay. Bismillah. He calls... But, uh, his father by his first name, Homer, not dad. 
We learned in many chapters before that this is not the way the relationship between father and son should be. But unfortunately, this, these ways have crept slowly into Muslim families too. So we have to be very careful to understand this hadith that cursing, cursing the uh, parents face to face is out of the question. This is far from it. The Sahaba when they asked, they understood it to be cursing uh, someone else's parents. And they Now we need to understand one more thing. That la'ana, man la'ana abawayhi. If we look at the word la'ana, one of the meanings of it is to push away. Specifically to push away ba'udah and rahmatillah. To push away. The interesting thing now we see today, it's common practice to push the parents away. That when they get a certain age, now it's time to you to go and live amongst other old people. No, we don't want you with us. Because the society today does not value the youth and it doesn't value the elderly. Our tradition teaches us the value of every elderly person. They have hikmah. They have knowledge. They have much, many things we can gain when they have white hairs. But the society today sees them as a burden, so now they begin to push them away. La'ana. To push them away from their own families. And in subhanAllah, what we see today, look at the situation. They've pushed away the parents, and they've pushed away having children. What joy is left in life for them? The joy of the family is the family being together. Children, father, grandparents. This is the joy of our families. But the families we see today, there's no social structure. Children are delayed. We don't want many. And parents are pushed away out of sight. This is far from what Islam is teaching us. So what does Rasulullah Sallallahu teach us? That the one who pushes his parents away, he himself will be pushed away from the Rahmah of Allah. How so? Look at the people today. The same ones pushing away children because they want to live life to the fullest are the same ones that are growing old alone. Growing old alone, having no one to be with them. Having no one at all to comfort them. So we see the exact cycle repeating. Whoever pushes these things away, he himself will be a victim of those exact same things. So these traditions and customs we have in Islam, we need to celebrate them and keep them. And understand that this is a part of our deen. And actually it's a part of American society too. It's just in the recent times. It's just in the recent times that these things have been put, uh, pushed into society even more. And the last thing in this hadith, the last thing in this hadith <coughs> is لَعَنَ Allah مَنْ awa muhdithan. That the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the one who pushes away an innovator. Who hosts, oh, I'm sorry, who, who hosts or brings protection, covers or helps out an innovator. The first thing we need to understand from this aspect of the hadith is that this word muhdithan also refers to anyone doing any type of wrong deed. That if someone is doing something wrong, we don't support that deed. We don't awahu. We don't bring him into our house. We don't give him protection. Because if we are giving him protection, it's ar it's a sign of being complacent and happy with this wrong deed. So the la'ana is for the one who supports or protects anyone doing anything wrong. Any type of transgression. And interesting, this word awa, awa means to give this person protection and bring into your, your, your home for, for, per se. So subhanAllah, how many things have we brought in our house that we know are wrong? For the sake of our children and whatnot. These things bring the la'anat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing we learn from this hadith is that the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for the one who protects anyone.
gives them protection who's doing something wrong. If something is wrong, we have to qumu lil qist. We have to stand up for truth. Walaw ala anfusikum. Interesting enough, the Quran says that we should stand up for truth even if it's against your own self. So this is the first message we need to understand from Awa Muhdithan. The next thing we need to understand <coughs> is Muhdith is a one that does bid'ah. Bid'ah. And we need to understand what bid'ah is. We need to understand what exactly is this word bid'ah. I don't think there is any Muslim who hasn't heard this word. Within the first week of accepting Islam, I think I heard this word. Even before I heard Salah, I think I heard this word bid'ah. So you learn it very quick. What is bid'ah? So we need to... First thing I want to explain as we go into this concept of bid'ah, this is a concept many people don't understand. And to judge what is bid'ah and what isn't bid'ah is something many great ulama, great scholars have refrained from doing because it's such a difficult task. Saying what is bid'ah and what isn't bid'ah is a very, very difficult task. It's not for the awam, the common layperson who knows very little about deen. Read a few books, sat in a few classes, and now he's passing fatwa. No. This bid'ah, what is bid'ah and what isn't bid'ah is a very complex and deep uh, science and field. But inshallah today, bi'ithnillah, you will get a lot of understanding on what bid'ah actually is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran uses this word bid'ah many times. وَمَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا مِنَ الرُّسُلِ قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا مِنَ الرُّسُلِ Say to them that I am not anything new from the Prophets. Allah is telling the Prophet sallallahu to tell them, I'm not new. Bid'ah. I am nothing new. I am like the Prophets that have come before. Badi'u samawati wal alp. The originator, the cr creator of the heavens and earth. Badir. This is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same word. Bid'ah. So, bid'ah is to make something without an example before. To make something new. Imam Shatibi, rahimahullah ta'ala, wrote an entire book called I I'tisam. And in I'tisam, he discusses this concept of bid'ah. He gives a, tra a, a, a definition of bid'ah, which we all need to listen to and understand. And the reason why we're spending time on this is because this is a very important issue, actually. Very important issue. So, everyone, if you have a comment or question, Comments are more, uh, I see that more often than questions. But if you have a comment, save it to the end and then insha'Allah. Imam Shatibi says that Bid'ah tariqatun fi deen Mukhtari'atun Tudahi sharia That Bid'ah is a way in the deen, in the deen, fi deen Mukhtari'atun Created, new That is trying to be similar to the actual sharia Okay? يَقْسِدُ بِالسُّلُوكِ عَلَيْهَا الْمُبَالِغَةَ فِي التَّعَبُدِ That the person doing it, his intention is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in the hadith, we have to understand that bid'ah is a very, very, very bad thing. Bad is not the word. Bid'ah is a way of leading to the hellfire. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said in the hadith that كُلُّ بِدَعَةٌ فِي ظَلَالَةٍ وَكُلُّ ظَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ that every bid'ah is, 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 is misguidance. And every misguidance leads to the fire of hell. So bid'ah, uh, some hadith say that when on qiyamah, when the kawthar, the pool of kawthar is in front, and Rasulullah sallallahu is, is giving to drink the ummah, there will be some angels pushing people away. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi will say that ummati, ummati, this is my, someone from my ummah, leave him alone. The angels will say, no, you don't know what he started after you. Meaning he started a new bid'ah. Why is bid'ah so bad? Because it's changing the deen of Allah. It's changing the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ 
the ayah, the last ayah, one of the last ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that today I have perfected your religion. You cannot change the religion. The way it is, is perfect. So, uh, another hadith, Man ahdatha fi amrina, that whoever creates something new, فَهُوَ رَدٌ That this thing is rejected. So, the first thing we need to understand <coughs> is that bid'ah and subhanallah, one of the effects of bid'ah is that the ulama say, when a person leaves a sunnah, he brings in a bid'ah. In order to stay away from bid'ah, adapt the sunnah. This is the way to protect from bid'ah. Adapt the sunnah. When the sunnah comes, the opposite has to go. The bid'ah has to go. So, the first thing we learn is that this word bid'ah is general. It means anything new. Anything new. Our computers. Our cars. All these things are new. Are they bid'ah? We'll understand more insha'Allah. We have to understand something. That for something to be, for us to understand bid'ah, the first thing we have to know the, know the hadith. We have to know Islam. Because bid'ah is anything contrary to the deen, correct? If you only read two or three books, if you only read one hadith book, how would you know that anything is bid'ah? How would you know yourself that this thing is against the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu Personally, how would you know? You would not know. Because your knowledge is so limited that everything you're hearing, you've never read a hadith for it. So the first thing we need to understand, in order to judge and say something is bid'ah, you need to have a very deep knowledge of sharia. For example, a brother will come sometimes and say such and such a thing is bid'ah, brother. He doesn't know there's a clear hadith on this thing. He's saying bid'ah, but because it's not in two books, he thinks this thing is bid'ah now. Because it's not in the two books he's familiar with. But there's a hadith of this thing. So the first thing we need to understand is that we need to have a deep knowledge of the sharia in order to judge something as bid'ah. Next thing we need to understand. Next point two. There are certain things there was no need of them. At the time of the Rasul Sallallahu But later those things because of necessity were put into deen. Those things are not bid'ah. There are certain things that were not at the time of Rasul. And the necessity was not there. The necessity was not there. But the necessity came later. So now that thing was brought up. <coughs> that thing also is not bid'ah. That thing is not bid'ah also. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. And I hope inshallah we keep everyone's attention because this will save a lot of misconception. This will save a lot of confusion if we just listen closely. At the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu there were many huffaz of the Qur'an. Sah? Correct? Good. In the battle of Muta, what happened? After Rasulullah Sallallahu at the time of Abu Bakr, many of the huffaz of the Qur'an were shaheed. They were martyred. At that moment, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes to Umar. And he says, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Umar, we have to do something. We have to write down the Quran all together. Now let me clarify one other misconception that people may orient, orientalists especially. The Quran was written entirely at the, in the life of the Rasul. Completely. But put into one book? No. That was happened. That happened. And the incident I'm explaining right now. So now what happened? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala who comes to Umar and he says to him what? That we have to compile the entire Quran. What is the first thing Umar radiallahu ta'ala who says? How can we do something that the Prophet said we, we didn't do? We can't. 
Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, yuraddiru. He kept, keeps telling him, we have to do this. We have to do this. For the sake of the deen, we have to do this. Until Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, who says, my heart opened. And I realized. Now they go to Ubay bin Ka'b. That we need you to write the Quran. What's the first thing he says? How can we do something the Prophet never did? Now they're both talking to him. They're both convincing him. No, we have to do this. We have to do this thing. Until the Quran was compiled and put into a book. So, what do we see here? What we have to differentiate is between objectives, maqasid, and wasila, the means to something. I don't want to lose people here. But you have to understand this. It will give you a lot of sukoon and afia fi hayatik. A lot. I'll give you another example, and through these examples you'll understand something. At the time of the Sahaba, was there any dots on the Arabi? You know the dots? For a jim, where's the dot? A nukta. For a ba, for a ta, where's the dot? Were there any dots before? No dots. The dots were put later. Sorry. Harakat. Where we see the haraka on top of the ba, bi, bu. Were there any harakat before? No. It came at the time of Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Tayyip. After. Abu As Asad ad Ali was the first to do this. Continuing. Nowadays, um, the Jews, we have Jews of Quran. The Quran is broken into Jews. Were there Jews at that time? No Jews. The Jews were put later for you to read easily in a month. We should use that. Five. Next, go, let's go to the next step. Maybe some of your kids have a color-coded Quran. Where did this come from? Brother, this is bid'ah. You're putting color into the Quran? The Rasul Sallallahu never put color in the Quran. <clears throat> How are you doing this, brother? It's bid'ah. This brother has not understood the meaning of bid'ah. See, let me explain the difference between maqsad and wasila. Rasulullah Sallallahu came to teach us yetlu alayhim ayati. He came to teach us how to read the Quran. So now we have different means through which we are able to read the Quran. As long as these means are not specifically against the Sharia, these means are allowed to use. And we come to a term, everyone should write these terms down right here. Liddin and fiddin. Liddin means for the deen. Fiddin means in the deen. A true bid'ah which is wrong and leads to the fire of hell is a bid'ah fiddin. When you change something in the religion. But brother, um, you're changing the Quran. You're changing the Quran. You're putting it into a book. Rasulullah Sallallahu didn't do that. Even the putting the Qur'an together is lid-deen. Even the color-coded Qur'an is lid-deen, for the deen. For the deen. Once we understand the difference of for the deen and in the deen, you'll understand small concepts like the line on the floor. The line on the flo fo floor, I'll ask you, is it lid-deen or fid-deen? It's liddin. Why? Why is the line there? It wasn't there at the time of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brother, why are you doing that? For? For? To make the line straight. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, make the lines straight. So the maqsad, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, make the line straight. Now whatever means you use to make the line straight, it's permissible to use as long as it's not directly going against something from the hadith or the Qur'an. 
I hope everyone understands this principle. Once you, once you understand this principle of lid deen and fid deen, you'll understand a lot of things. A lot of things. Now, we can look at many things now. Driving your car to the masjid. Fid deen, lid deen. Lid deen. Using a microphone. You're reading Quran. You're leading salah. This is a part of deen. It's in the masjid. Another thing, bidda doesn't just come in the masjid. Those saying bidda, bidda, go home and apply sunnah there too. Bidda is a whole life. Uh, sunnah is a whole life. Not just in the masjid. Okay? Remember that. The next thing, microphone. Is this for deen or in deen? For deen, exactly. Next thing we need to understand. Now we're going into the category of fid deen. Again, I don't want to lose everyone, but this is very important. For those understanding, they understand the importance of this. What does it mean to have a bidah fid deen? I'll give you an example. There are different things in the deen. Sunnah, wajib, fard. There are some things that are fard. You have to do that. It's from the Quran or mutawatir. There are some things that are sunnah. There are some things that are mustahab, good to do. There are some things that are wajib. If you take any permissible act and believe that to become sunnah, you just created a bidah. Yes, fiddin. If you take something and think it wajib, you just created a bidah. Fiddin. So we understand another principle from this. Not every action can we say if it's bid'ah if the person doing it knows that it's not a part of deen. Let me give an example. I say to you brothers, you know brothers, a lot of us are getting out of shape. So from now on, after Fajr, we're going to run a mile in the, you know, on the trail here. And we're also going to do dhikr, we're going to say, La ilaha illallah a hundred times while we run. Good thing to do. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, is dhikr permissible to do? Simple question. Yes. yes. Are you supposed to do dhikr? Yes. But I just made it specific with running. We're going to run tomorrow and we're going to do dhikr. Tell me when, very calmly, tell me when that would become a bid'ah fid deen. When you think that this running every day saying la ilaha illallah is a part of the deen, that it's sunnah, or wajib, or mustahab. See, not just doing it every day. Doing it every day is fine. As long as you're not jahil, and you know, brother, this is not sunnah. This is just a good thing to do. It's not fard, it's not wajib, it's not sunnah. You're not changing anything in the deen. Subhanallah, brothers, think over this. Understand this principle. It will save you from a lot. And you'll be able to help a lot of brothers too. A lot of brothers. When a person thinks... Now, once, once everyone has digested this, we're going to go to another type of bidah, which is called bidah idhafi. Okay? Not comments. Are there any questions to what I just said? <coughs> any questions? Does this mean that something like this? Uh, sorry. Exactly. I've been, I've been asking the question, is this, is this bidah? Because I've seen some sheikhs say it's bidah. I'm not doing bidah, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Brother, good example. Sorry. Sometimes there's actions we do, and our culture has done them so much that everyone now thinks that's a part of deen. This is where we need to be careful of bid'ah. If it's not from the sunnah, you need to understand that this deed is not sunnah whatsoever. Not sunnah whatsoever. But if this deed has become so common in the culture, just the mere doing this act would be bid'ah. Because it's too common now. And everyone thinks that it's a part of deen. Brother, this is what we do. This is our custom. 
No, no. This is not a part of deen. Everyone thinks it's a part of deen. Now it has become a bid'ah. Do you get the difference now? This is a very hard... Again, this is not for the regular person to decipher. This is for ulama to decipher. Because it's very difficult to judge when it's crossed that line. I'll give you an example. Sometimes there's something that in a culture somewhere else overseas, they do it as a part of deen. In America, it's not a part of deen. No one does it as a part of deen. Again, this topic is too deep for the regular person. But you have enough knowledge now with these basic things of lid deen and fid deen to understand why this is just like using the car to come to the masjid. Yes, sister. Question, not comments. No, that, that <coughs> Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he got all of the people together for tarawih, and he saw them all praying together, tell us what he said. Ni'matu bidati hadha. You know what he said? What a great bid'ah. Yes. He said, Ni'mati bidati hadha. What a great bid'ah this is. Brothers, what more do we need? He said bid'ah, listen to this. He said bid'ah, but it's actually sunnah. Why? Because Rasul said, grab my sunnah and the sunnah of my khulafa al-rashideen. So he's saying, what a beautiful bid'ah, and it becomes sunnah. Now that is restricted to their time. Because the Prophet said, follow them, their sunnah is my sunnah. So that is restricted. But the wording is what I'm trying to show you. He called it a bid'ah and said, what a great bid'ah. What that shows you is that there is bid'ah lid-deen and bid'ah fid-deen. There's a difference. There is a difference. Question? Yes. Does this apply to celebrating certain events? I don't want to go into the details. Yeah. As, yeah. Especially when they... A proof that it's so much a part of the person's deen... They feel hurt when they can't do it. This shows that it's become that much embedded into the, into the society. That if we don't do it, now we did something wrong, brother. No, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Okay? So I hope, inshallah, we spent, we went over time. We're done for today. But if there's any questions, not comments. Comments get very long and it's going to get late tonight. If there's any questions on bid'ah, lid-deen, fid-deen. Brothers, Today, inshallah, we'll have it set as a separate lecture on the website that we could just download this lecture. What is bid'ah? I do have a question. Here. Yes, ask a question, inshallah. Question. And something the hadith and so forth. Is it somewhat like, I don't know, Morocco, Egypt, Pakistan, uh -huh. Arabian? Yes. Do people have different ways of interpreting the meaning? Yes, brother. Okay. For sure. Of the same thing? Yes, see, listen, right. you have to understand. Okay. If I was to tell everyone that they all have to go to D.C. and there's only one road you can use. Right. Everyone go to D.C. tomorrow, but you only have one road. What's going to happen? Too much. I just want to clarify that. What if we say get to D.C. any way you can? What happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made our sharia vast. There's many ways to get to the same objective, brother. Put in, go in the car, take your GPS and your phone GPS. Put in the same address. Many times you'll get different directions. Does it get you to the same way? Yes. There's different interpretations to the Quran and to the hadith. But all of this is guiding us to the sahih, to, to Jannah. I don't, I don't think that's a good example, brother, of GPS. Because <laughs> when you have two GPSs, giving you a different road, 